Bearcat Mathematicians. All right, we have um, quite a bit to discuss today. We've got vertical line tests, zeros of functions, just a new approach, both of those you've been exposed to, increasing, decreasing, and constant functions. Again, you've had exposure to that. The average rate of change, which is a just a transition from slope, and then even and odd functions, which is probably brand new for you. All right, let's go ahead and get started on the vertical line test review of what we know. We know that if we put a vertical line, I'm going to change colors here, put a vertical line through that graph, it would hit the graph at more than one point, so this would not be a function. We just discussed horizontal lines, so let's just think about that. If we went this way, it would only touch the graph in one place, so the inverse of this particular graph would be a function. They would not be one-to-one -one because one is not a function. Uh, let's go ahead and try the next one. If we put a, uh, ver a vertical line, we would get a function. If we put a horizontal line, we would not get a function, and this would not be one-to-one. -one. And finally, if we put a horizontal line, I'm sorry, vertical line, we would be a function. If we put a horizontal line, I believe anywhere along here, we would be a function. And the, inver or the uh, inverse would have a function, and this would be a one-to-one. -one. This is kind of a strange graph because it's a piecewise function, but often used in math as we go further along. All right, let's go ahead and review zeros now. And the notation I want you to get familiar with is f of x equals zero, or when y is equal to zero. We've been solving <clears throat> zeros for a long time. You've learned all about it in uh, quadratics, um, all the methods of factoring and quadratic formula and all that, all of those methods just leading us to finding zeros of the function and zeros of the function um, give us our solutions, our roots, um, the zeros of what they're called, and also on a graph, the x-intercepts. That all holds true. The notation looks a little different. So instead of saying when y equals zero, we're going to say f of x equals zero. And anytime you see that notation, you're basically solving the equation equal to zero. Or you could say it's the x values that give a y value a zero. All right, let's look at a couple of examples. All right, let's take a look at this equation and let's find its zeros. So we want f of x equal to zero, or basically want this whole equation equal to zero. So we want all of this equal to zero. So basically we've set the equation equal to zero. It's a quadratic. You know we have several methods to solving quadratics. Hopefully we can factor because that's the easier one. If not, then we would have completing the square, our quadratic formula to fall back on. Um, I believe we can factor. The factoring here is a little bit more intense because of this leading coefficient of three. Um, I don't know for sure, but I think you've been exposed to what we call slip and divide or slip and slide, some teachers may have called it, as a just a technique or a, a strategy or tool in factoring with coefficients greater than three. I'm going to use that here. If you have another method, if you guess and check, then that's fine as long as you can factor, of course, without using a calculator. So I'm going to take this three and I'm going to slip it out of the problem and move it over here by the 10. When I do, I'm going to be left with y squared plus, I'm sorry, x squared plus x minus, and I'm going to multiply those two, so I have negative 30. Now I did slip it out of the problem, I don't want to forget in a minute that I'm going to have to divide it away um, in just a minute after I factor. This makes our factoring much more simple, and it's just basic factoring, and remember all this is equal to zero. So I have x and x, and then I need numbers that multiply to 30, but add to positive 1. Um, I believe that's going to be our 6 and our 5, and that would be a positive 6 and a negative 5. Now, I'm not done. I have to slip this 3 back into our problem, and that means I'm going to divide by 3 here, and I'm going to divide by 3 here. When I do that, I will get x plus 2, and I will get x minus 5 thirds equals 0. Now, you may see this in the future written 
without the fractions. It's pretty easy to do. This one doesn't have a fraction. This one right here, you would clear your fraction of three by multiplying both terms by three. So you could say your factors are x plus two and three x minus five. You need to be comfortable changing those forms. Um, for solving though, it's actually easier to go from here. So our x values would make that would make this true is what would make this factor equal to zero would be a negative two, and what would make this factor equal to zero would be a positive five thirds. And those would be your zeros. All right, so to, on a table, that would look like this. At negative two, you would have a zero, and at five thirds, you would have a zero for your x and y ordered pairs. On a graph, at negative two, you would have a zero, and at five thirds, you would have a zero. And then, of course, our um, if x was zero, you go back to your original equation. If x was zero and you put zeros in for it, you'd be at negative ten down here at zero. And your graph would look something like this, but these would be the zeros of the graph that you had just found. Um, so we have x-intercepts, which are um, which these are also called on a graph. Of course, they're called zeros. They're called roots and old school solutions. All right, let's move on. All right, let's take a look at this equation. We have uh, f of x equals the square root of 10 minus x squared. Um, okay, again, we're just going to set this equal to zero. We're going to pretend like we're equaling zero. So we have the square root of 10 minus x squared equals zero. Let's go ahead and solve it. The first thing you should note, though, oh, big, is that we would have a domain restriction. When we get ready, we can find our zeros, which gives us some critical values. But we're going to have to determine for what values between those zeros is our equation true. Um, because we have a square root, remember the values that would be true would be values that make it either zero or positive. Zero or positive, we cannot have a negative square root. So just keep that in mind. And you're going to constantly be looking for those things. We'll see that in a graph in just a second. First, let's just start by finding those x-intercepts or zeros. So we would square both sides and we would get with 10 minus x squared equals zero. We would subtract the 10 and or, or move the x squared over. And if we move the x squared over, we would end up with x squared equals 10. If you need to subtract it and then change the signs, that's fine. But hopefully you can understand that math right there. If you don't, make sure you talk to me about it or your neighbor about it in class. All right, and then of course we would take a square root. Now, a um, couple of things, I don't know if you uh, have been told this or not, and this again is just a little funny way to remember it. It's not mathematical necessarily. But when you're solving, only when you're solving, and you take the square root. It did not exist in the problem already. Right now, when we get to this step, we don't have a square root, and we're about to take the square root. Then you become the artist of that square root, and I always kind of think so you need to sign your artwork, plus or minus. That way you don't forget, and you also don't put a plus or minus when it's not valid. Um, I'll explain that a little more to you in class if you need some more help on that. But in this case, we would have x equals positive or negative square roots of 10. Um, because when we're solving, we added in our own square root. All right, so let's take a look at that. So on a table again, what that, what that would mean is at the square root of 10, we would have a zero, and at the negative square root of 10, we would have a zero. On a graph, let's take a look at what that would look like. All right, at the square root of 10, we would have a zero, and at the negative, square root of 10, we would have a zero. Now, what we have to do, those are critical values. What values in between or on either side would make this true? So do we want values, is our graph going to go, you know, from this graph, it's going to go off this direction and off this direction, or is it going to be the values in between? Well, let's talk a little bit about what happens. Um, let's just check a point out. Let's see what happens at zero. If we put a zero in for x, our y value, would be the square root of 10, which is a positive number. So we'll just go up here and label that the square root of 10. So, and that makes it true. So I'm going to assume it would be all the values between here and here that make that graph true. These are your x-intercepts. This is your y-intercept. Um, graphing by x and y-intercepts is also a very helpful thing. All right, let's do one more example. All right.
getting to a little more pre-cal thinking now. All right, here's our problem. F of X equals 2T minus 3 divided by T plus 5. T plus 5. Okay, this is a rational function. Um, it's a fraction. Just think of it as a fraction. And you need to ask yourself, what makes a fraction 0? Is the numerator or the denominator that makes it 0? Think of something really simple. If I say 0 over 4 versus 4 over 0, which one is 0? Hopefully you said this would be equal to 0. That means the numerator was the 0. Hopefully you told me this was undefined and the slope uh, for the first one, well, it's not... Anyway, we're not worried about that. This would be an undefined term because you cannot divide by zero. So those are domain restrictions. Um, so a couple of things that we know is our domain restriction here would be that t could not equal negative 5. And that's important to write down right at the beginning of your problem. All right, we also know that if we can make the numerator zero, the entire equation will be equal to zero. So let's just come down and set 2t minus 3 equal to 0. We're going to add the t, get 2t equals 3, and t would be 3 halves. So our 0 is 3 halves. And that's kind of important. So if we were going to put a table down, we would say that we would have a 0 at 3 halves. So at 3 halves, we would be 0. This is our x and this is our y. So we have an x-intercept at 3 halves. We have a restriction at negative 5. So when t would be negative 5, we would have an undefined term. And that's what it would look like maybe in a table. All right, let's move on to increasing, decreasing, and constant functions, identifying that. All right, let's take a look at increasing, decreasing, and constant. Um, I just want to quickly go through this. Um, I'm going to label a few points here. All right. In this first graph, the graph as you move from left to right is constantly moving up. So it's increasing. Um, this part of the graph is increasing. And this part of the graph, because it's moving up, is increasing. So this, this graph is increasing from, if you're looking at the, if you think about the x values, from negative so on the interval, negative infinity to positive infinity. All right, this graph is increasing from here. And visually, you can see it moves downward from here. So this is decreasing. And then this is increasing again from here. So we have both increasing and decreasing in this particular problem. And let's. this is how you would write your intervals. It is increasing on the interval from negative infinity up to negative 1. We're only talking about the x values. And in intervals, you just are going to write soft brackets. And then we are increasing again from 1, right here, to positive infinity. We're decreasing on the interval from negative 1 to positive 1. And that's how you would write that. And then finally, in our third graph, we would be increasing. We're constant. And then we're decreasing. And again, we would write increasing, increasing from negative infinity to zero. We're constant between zero and two. And in the interval from two to positive infinity, we would be decreasing, provided this graph went on in that direction. Couple, of, One other thing I want to mention, and there's more about it in your book, and there is a great Khan Academy video, if you would like to watch, um, on relative max and relative min. And it's a really important concept as we move further, and we'll talk a little bit more about it um, when we go into polynomials, but I just want to mention it to you. This would be considered a relative max. And this would be considered a relative min. And this is a relative max because as you approach it, everything would be below that point. And as you move on the other side, everything's below that point. Uh, for a relative min, as you approach from the left side, everything's 
above that point and as you move from the right side everything's above that point so that becomes the lowest point or the minimum value um, but again there's a great Khan Academy video you might want to go in and just Google Khan Academy and then type in relative min and max and um, listen to that video all right last we're going to do average rate of change and then on to even and odd functions all right we're going to expand on our knowledge of slope um, and we're going to move on to something called the average rate of change. The average rate of change. Um, slope was used for just linear, straight linear equations where the um, it was a, a constant average rate of change. And we've known back from the beginning that M represented slope. It was rise over run. We knew it was Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. And now I want to expand that just a little bit. Basically, it's delta Y or the change in Y over delta X, which is the change in X. Um, we talked a lot about notation, a lot about notation. And I want you to change your Y minus Y to function notation because we won't be just talking about the slope of a line now. It will be the slope between two points. So we're going to change this and we're going to write it this way. We're going to write it as F of X, sorry sub 2 minus f of x sub 1. We know f of x is the same as y. So it's the y value of at point at the point where you have your second point and minus the y value of the first point. Um, over our change in x and our change in x would just be your x sub 2 minus your x sub 1 which is the same. So the only thing we've done is we've written our function notation. So instead of y we're written f of x which is the same as y. So this is not hugely different but a little bit. Let's take a look at this graph below. In the past when we wanted slope it was all about just linear equations. Now we're talking about the slope between two particular points and we know if we draw a line between two particular points like in this case we could find the slope of that particular line, which would be the average rate of change between those two points. Now, <clears throat> it's not the constant rate of change because this graph moves up and the change is different than this part of the graph between those two points, but it would give us an average rate of change. And that's all I'm going to go on to right now, but this would be a line because it moves through two points. It would be a secant line, a secant line. So often you will see it written with a little secant at the bottom. So the slope of a secant line because we're not talking about just straight old linear equations. And our average rate of change, again, we're going to write it as f of x sub 2 minus f of x sub 1 over x squared minus, I'm sorry, x sub 2 over minus x sub 1. That's really important. We're about to apply this to, uh, to an equation. We're about to apply this to an equation. So let's get ready to do that example. Okay, if you look back at the graph we had just written out, I just extracted the two points that we drew that line through, that secant line through. The two points were negative 2, 2, and 0, 0. And so this, of course, is our um, x sub 1 and y sub 1, and this would be our x sub 2 and y sub 2. Um, but again, we're only going to be interested really in our average rate of change in our x values. This is the actual entire equation because we can't use both these because this is not a constant rate of change. It's an average rate of change, and that's the part that's a little different. So we're not talking about just a, any line. We're talking about a line between these two points on this very curvy graph. This is the equation of that curvy graph. So we're going to do our f of, and remember we want our x sub 2 minus our f of x sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1, and that's our average rate of change formula. You need to go ahead and memorize that. Although you really don't memorize it, it's the same. It's y minus y over x minus x. It's nothing really that different, except you've got to use the entire function. So think about if I had f of x sub 2. Well, that would make my x here 0. <laughs> so I'd have f of 0. For this one, it would be like f of 0. So we could go ahead and write that out. So it would be like f of 0 minus f of, and then x sub 1 is negative 2. 
all over, and then this would be 0 minus 2. So that part's really easy. And now we're just going to sub in. So if we sub in f of 0, I'm going to do this over the side, we would get 0 cubed minus 3 times 0. All right, well, that would just be 0. So f of 0 is 0. So this is actually 0. And if we have f of negative 2, I'm just doing this off to the side. You might can do this in your head. You would have negative 2 cubed minus 3 times negative 2. All right, be careful here. Negative 2 cubed is a negative 8. And then you can think of this as a negative 3 times a negative 2, or you can cover up the subtraction sign and think of it as a negative 6, and then minus a negative would be positive. I just think this is negative 3 times negative 2, which is positive 6, which my output then would be negative 2. So f of negative 2 is negative 2. So we have minus a negative 2, which is going to be plus a positive. And down here, oops, I missed my negative sign. We have minus a negative 2, which is also plus a positive. So this is positive 2. So we end up having 2 over 2 or 1. And our average rate of change is 1. That is not the actual rate of change, our constant rate of change, but it is the average rate of change. We'll learn more about that as we move on. But that's a very important concept. All right, finally we're going to talk about even and odd functions. The nice thing about this is, is you've paid really good attention and understood our whole symmetry uh, information before, then you really have already done this. You just need to make a connection. You need to make the connection that if a graph has y-axis symmetry, then it is an even function. And if a graph has origin symmetry, it is an odd function. That was pretty easy, origin and odd. Y-axis symmetry is the one that we're most familiar with. That's just your basic, think about your basic uh, parabola uh, at with the vertex at zero then you would have y-axis symmetry when the vertex is at 0, 0. Um, so those are just your basic two things. Our test for symmetry, remember, for y-axis is when we changed our x value to a negative and to see if the equation can come back out. And for origin symmetry, we changed our x and our y to the opposite sign and to see if it came out the same. So let's go ahead and just do a little quick review of that. So the first thing I would do, I'm going to check for even to see if this is an even function, or I'm going to check to see if this is a, a symmetric with the y-axis. So to do that, I'm going to write it as y equals x cubed minus x, and I'm going to change my x to a negative. So I'm going to say y equals, in parentheses, negative x cubed minus parentheses negative x. So now I'm going to say y equals. Well, if I take a negative and cube it, it would be a negative. If I take a negative times a negative, it's going to be a positive x. If I were to multiply through by a negative, everything by a negative, then I would have a negative y, I would have a positive x, and I'd have a negative x, which is not the same as my original equation. So this is not an even function. Now, if it is it an odd function? An odd function, I would only change um, I would only change the um, um, y value. So let's just do that. If I change just the y value, if I multiplied through, then my, um, my signs would all change, and this would also not be. So this is not odd either. Let's see what happens if we change both. If I make a negative y, and I make this a negative x, and I say minus a negative x, well, this would be a negative y. This would be a negative because cubing it would be negative, and this would be a positive x. If I change all my signs, I would get a positive y, a positive x, and a negative x. And I believe this graph is the same as this graph. So this would make it an odd function with origin symmetry to practice that just a little bit. All right, let's take a look at this question and see if we have, um, let's see if we have y-axis um, symmetry or if it's an even function. One of the hints is in these exponents. If all the exponents are odd and there's no constant, then often um, you have an odd function. And if the exponents are even and there's no constant, 
often you have an even function but with the constant you have to kind of check things out so let's let's try that so if we do that and we change our x to a negative so we would have y equals negative x and we would square it plus one and y equals if you take a negative and square it, you would get a positive x squared plus one i believe these two match so i believe this is an even function with y axis symmetry all right Hope you have a good day. Go Bearcats!